Everyone hear me okay? Outstanding. All right. My name is Adam Hyland, and uh, I'm going to talk a bit today about the uh, article feedback tool and uh, Wikipedia's internal peer review system. And uh, I'll go into, for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, the Wikipedia peer review system and the article feedback tool, I'll go into a little bit of what they do. But that's basically the rundown of the talk. So how many of you are familiar with this box? Show of hands. All right, so you normally see it, well, you could see it at the bottom of an English Wikipedia article. Hopefully, when you come to it, the stars are not already filled in. Um, depending on which version you may have seen, you would have seen something different down at the bottom. Um, and this is, the, this is the look of the article feedback version 4 system. And it, and it in, bears some similarity to earlier versions. But article, version, uh, article feedback version 4 looked a lot like this. Now, how many of you are familiar with this. All right, it's entirely possible that fewer of you would be familiar unless you went to an earlier presentation as it is in the process of being rolled out. This is not the only manifestation, but this is one way that the version five of the article feedback system works. So what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about featured articles, which on the English Wikipedia are denoted with these uh, five-pointed stars that are uh, circumscribed, and good articles, which are denoted with the uh, green plus. These are two tranches of Wikipedia peer review that represent a fairly small share of articles. And we're going to compare them basically to what readers have to tell us through the article feedback system. So a little bit about the article feedback tool. It was deployed in 2010 in its initial version and version four, which is where the data come from and what we're going to be looking at today was ramped up through 2011. It started a very small uh, deployment, 1% and then ramped up to 5% and so on and so forth. The purpose of the article feedback tool was, uh, you know, as its, as its name might imply, was to provide a mechanism for readers to offer feedback. The traditional mechanism for readers to offer feedback on a Wikipedia article was to either edit the page or to click over to the talk page and then start a new section or attempt to figure out the, the uh, formatting and then leave a comment there. And we didn't see a terrible amount of conversion rate for people doing that, so the foundation said, well, what if we had something that was uh, a little, had a little lower friction in terms of use and was also much more prominent than a small uh, text link at the top of the page. And the other purpose was it was designed to engage readers. Now, what we're going to look at a little bit is because we got so much reader feedback and because it was offered through this somewhat very quantitative uh, uh, venue, um, we can get a little side effect. So we get to see, well, Yes, this was provided so that readers could offer their input, but we also can start scoring and ranking Wikipedia articles based on reader input. So what does this look like? So I mentioned that they had a rollout. So we're looking at 2011. Uh, the dates are very small, I apologize for that, but uh, starts in uh, March. And from March to May, it's on 1% of uh, Wikipedia articles. From, uh, from May to July, it's on 5% with a jump up to 10% there. And then it's on 100% for the rest of them. The two big gaps that you see there are uh, gaps in some of the data dumps that I got. They didn't actually reflect the results. But so you can imagine that the, the complete data set is pretty much a solid line across the top. So we're looking at effectively six months of public data on rating on about 800,000 articles that were rated. And we got approximately 2.5 million responses. And if we go back a bit, you see that we have four possible categories. And when I say we got two and a half million responses, that means two and a half million people clicked the submit ratings button. And they could have rated one category, two categories, three categories, or four categories. So we can end up with something, you know, anywhere between, um, you know, 10 million and uh, two and a half million actual ratings of articles. And it ends up somewhere around six million. So, what are featured articles? So I mentioned that we're going to be comparing the reader feedback to our internal peer review system. A featured article is effectively the highest level of peer review on the English Wikipedia. And I don't want to say that it's the highest level of quality because that will, you know, there may be someone in the audience who would dispute, but there is certainly the most rigorous form of peer review. And possibly as a result, there are only about 3,600 
articles that, you know, less than one tenth of one percent um, on the English Wikipedia, which are featured. And there are the 2200 featured lists, which for our purposes, uh, although not for some of the analysis, we're just going to sort of lump together because it's a very similar process. When you want to grade an article as a featured article, it is a group review process with very strict rules as to what can disqualify an article and how long you can be in a review process. Um, as such, it's very sensitive to editor preferences. So it's because it's run almost entirely by long-term editors. So what we see reflected in featured articles is probably going to reflect the constituency of long-term editors on Wikipedia and maybe not necessarily general editor interest or general reader interest. It may or may not. And it also has some idiosyncrasies. And there's some, you know, there, you know, a sh small number of people who, uh, you know, who diligently and, and tirelessly operate the feature article process, but they may have some sort of proclivity toward a given article or not. There may be certain articles that don't end up ever on the front page with today's featured article. Uh, there are certain classes of articles that we don't put up there. Perhaps we see fewer of those going through the candidacy process. So these are possible reasons why this may not just select for quality. And the next level down are good articles. There's about 15,000 of these, and these are reviewed by one person, and it's a deliberately less strict review process, but it's still relatively rigorous. There's a rubric, there's an expectation, there's a review process, and most of these articles go through a, um, a reasonable peer review. I think that some in the audience may jump up and disagree at this point, but I, it's a fair statement. Um, it's less idiosyncratic than featured articles in some way because you get a much bigger mix of articles coming in and maybe it's less dependent on editor preference. We don't know. So what are the data that we got? So the, I mentioned that we had six months of relatively public data. Um, every time someone hit submit rating on an article, you got information on the time that they rated it, an anonymized hash of their IP address or username, and it's just, just a way to identify individual people that were rating things without actually exposing any personal information. Um, you got the length of the article. I've gone and found at the time the good article or featured article status. And you got some information on the user. If they responded to the section on saying, did you, uh, do you have a particular interest in this area? Do you have a skill in this area? Would you like to add to the encyclopedia? And we also get some information on whether or not it was a registered user or it was an IP editor. Um, some of that stuff is more useful than others. The distinction between registered editors and IP editors that were, or IP readers that were marking feedback mm, is less useful because to a first approximation, basically nobody in this room was using the feedback system. Nearly 99% of what I saw you see are non-registered users. So you get a good reflection, at least in my opinion, of what registered users are saying. Now, I put this big mess up here, all right? Now, at the bottom, we have a measure of article length, right? So I mentioned one of the things that we can capture is the length of the articles. And we can sort of imagine that very, very, very short articles may be uh, stubs or maybe something that's a fragment or maybe a redirect, although I got rid of most of those. And longer articles may have more content. And on the y-axis, you have the feedback average. So if we took over this whole six months and you found what was the feedback response that we got from our editors, the huge mass of orange, I'm a big no-no walking in front of this, the huge <coughs> mass of orange are the articles which have not been assessed in the featured article or good article process, whether they were assessed at one point and then moved out of there. And up here in sort of this upper right-hand quadrant are effectively all of the mass of articles that we see. Now, this isn't a particularly breathtaking um, <laughs> result because we might expect that somewhat longer articles and articles that were somewhat better treated by the, um, uh, or somewhat better reviewed by the average reader would probably be featured by the community. But we can think about this in a couple of different ways. The next slide, uh, for those of you that aren't statisticians, this may be a little confusing. All right, and I don't, for those of you that are, this is, these are probability distributions, the empirical probability distributions of the article length. So, um, and for those of you that aren't, think about just the peak. So these are the unassessed articles, right? It's a nice little bell curve and it peaks much below the rest of these. And you see good articles and featured lists are about the same length and very distinct from them, featured articles, right? 
And I don't necessarily bring this, I mean, this will come back later when we get into the model we use to assess this, but what we are seeing is there are distinctions among these particular classes of articles that maybe are not necessarily immediately related to quality, right? Because I know that all of the experienced Wikipedians in here will tell me that article length in bytes is not something that's related to quality, or at least I hope you will. So beyond a little summary statistics, we need to know a couple things. First of all, reader ratings follow page views. When people come and rate an article, it's because they found the article. Consequently, you have popular articles that are top of the rating list, right? Uh, Call of Duty, Justin Bieber, Lady Gaga, because it was the summer of 2011, you have uh, Andrews Brevik. Um, uh, Jimmy Wales is a very popular article, although not rated very highly. Um, <laughs> that's considerably below the average of about 4.1. And like I said before, they're predominantly non-editors. So this is the sort of, um, this is the sort of data that we're dealing with. And, and one way to visualize this, when I said that that most, you, know, you, had, you had some articles that were incredibly popular and some articles which maybe only got one or two views. I, some of you that are long-term editors of any uh, project know that there are plenty of subjects that see very little reader interest or even very little editor interest. So over here, we have a graph of the number of ratings that an article received and basically how many of them that we saw. So you, because this graph goes on to 1,200, zero is really one. So almost all of them received about one rating, which means that someone came by and clicked that button at most once and left one category. The next one is four and so on and so forth, but m almost all of them had rated in the course of six months and three months of a wide deployment less than 158 times, which means that the, you're dealing with a number of relatively, this is you're in the long tail. We've sort of swapped the perspective a little bit, but a lot of the ratings that you get are in articles that are not well trafficked. That's good and that's bad for some respects. But just to give you an idea of what we're looking at. So you can take this information and you can approach it from a sort of classical statistician standpoint. Now, the people that I, that I tried to drag into this, I said I promised I'm not going to have any equations and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to try and scare you with anything. So I'm going to breeze over this. Those of you that are interested, you can ask me questions or contact me later. Um, we have some support from our models that say there is a strong relationship between the rating and the likelihood of something being rated as an FA or a GA. Yeah, that's what I figured. I don't know why. <laughs> Yeah, okay, well, um, and this, so, and we also get the same thing with the linear model, but with a twist. So one of the things that I wanted to look at was whether or not an article being defeatured or whether or not an article being taken out of a good article status was reflected either before or after in the, in the reader feedback. And interestingly enough, when you, when you look at it just from an immediate standpoint, you find out, yes, that the articles that have been, that have been defeatured and the articles that have been um, that were not promoted had um, s significantly lower ratings. Again, not a shocking result. You would imagine this sort of thing. What is interesting is if you correct for just the small number of data, small other uh, metrics that we have, so article length, other elements of page views that the article got, that all goes away. So once you correct for what we think are stuff that varies with article quality, like length and perhaps popularity, um, there is, you don't see a big relationship between um, reader uh, ratings and the, the very top echelon of whether or not something is, is an FA or is not and gets dropped out. Um, for those of you that were in my other talk, uh, you can't escape the Cambridge endogeneity police and next slide will explain why. Uh, like I, I've been repeating, some of this stuff is not particularly shocking. It's because if we imagine that all of this, so editors come in and they review an article, readers come in and they rate an article, presumably all of, their, all of their ratings and all of their opinions about the article are coming from something about the article, right? So it's very difficult to test one of these against the other because they all tend to interact and they're all maybe driven by some third variable that we have. However, we can get something cool. So using even just a very simple data mining procedure, we can start to predict, not just 
say I have the whole data set and I'm going to measure the change between one and the other, we can start to build a model that says I'm going to guess whether or not this article is featured or not. And we, we take a small set of the data and we test the, we start training this model and then we test it out on the rest of the corpus and we find out that yeah, we get a pretty good idea. We can predict with reasonable accuracy whether or not something is going to be a featured article. Problem is, we guess wrong. We guess that it will be featured when it's not a lot of the time. Now, that's mostly driven by the fact that there are basically no featured articles and basically no good articles relative to the four million that we have. Um, if uh, this is scaring people, I'll oh, stop me. Um, so the, the last part of this that I want to talk about is the system's changing. We've got this cool quantitative metric that um, gave us a lot of interesting information and perhaps told us a lot about reader opinion. And we are switching from something where you get four categories and one to five stars to where it's yes or no, like or dislike, right? It's, it's Facebook or it's YouTube. Is this a problem? Right? Sometimes when we think about how rating systems work and we imagine, well, I would never want to rate a movie just yes or no. I would never want to rate an article just yes or no because I feel that there's an element of nuance to it. Um, that's sort of anecdotally possibly a problem. There's also problems with if we imagine that opinion is on some continuum from good to bad, that if we cut it off arbitrarily in the middle, we lose a lot of information and we can present to, we can potentially damage our ability to understand the problem in the first place. And Frank Harrell is a biostatistician writes all about this and you know this sort of thing is, is uh, fraught. Good news, readers don't care. Um, <laughs> this is actual reader ratings. Every time someone pushed the rating button, we averaged together what they gave us. So you can see it's very popular for them to rate all fives. That is an average and for those of you paying attention at home, the only way to get an average of five with four ratings is to rate them all five. <laughs> The next most popular one, just by a hair, is one. And again, the only way to get the average of one is for them all to be one. And then it's four. And so you see, you see some of these larger peaks in here and then some of these smaller ones. That's because we included, on the, uh, on the original graph, we included people who only rated it twice or three times. So you get different averages that can come out. When you say, I only want to see people who rated all four or rated fewer than four, it becomes much more stark. It's really clear that when readers come in, they rate it all five or they rate it all one, and usually in that order. So, in a, so anecdotally again, what this probably tells us is that we're in the clear. So for the skeptics in the house, that was just individual rating at an individual time. What happens if we talk about how this works on an average over the course of an article? Um, this may be a little hard to explain. All right. You have all the, you have these four categories, right? Uh, Well-sourced, neutral, complete, and readability. Readability is dropped for reasons beyond the scope of this discussion. Um, and we all, all just showed you that people rate them all fives or all ones. And what we see here is the number of times someone rates an article, or the number of times an article is rated, when this is four or eight or 12 or 16, all multiples of four, they tend to correlate very highly with each other. So. In other words, you're much more likely in the average, not just in the individual rating. So on an article, in an average on the article, you are much more likely to see when someone, when it gets a multiple of four, you're much more likely to see them all start to correspond. And there, that is a statistically significant difference for those of you that care about that kind of thing. So we can imagine that we might not lose that much information shifting to V5. The, nice, the other nice thing is this is borne out by our classifier. So we said, hey, we can predict whether or not we get something to be a featured article or not. And the way that that picks it is it, it takes the sort of small slices of, you know, uh, 4.5 to 5, 4.5 to 4, so on and so forth. Well, if we just tell the classifier, turn this into something yes, no, turn it into 5 and 1, and then deal with that, you really don't lose a lot of power, right? And it was never your concern in the first place. It was always sensitivity, but you don't lose a lot of power. Again, for those of you who are not statisticians, uh, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, what I mean to say is, those folks of you that are working on the article feedback tool, you've switched to something and it's okay. Those of you Wikipedians that are scared that the barbarians are at the gate because we can rate something plus or minus, it's okay. They were doing it anyway. <laughs> Alright, so look ahead, right? So I'm really excited because that's the kind of person I am. You should all be really excited too. Um, hopefully. 
Uh, <laughs> this is a great compliment to current research, research methods. I'm at something of a disadvantage because I don't live in San Francisco and I don't work for the foundation, so I don't get access to all the cool stuff that they do. But they do great work. You heard, if you were at uh, Fabrice's talk earlier, a lot of work about hand coding, a lot of work about A-B testing. This is all stuff that you get to do if you control the infrastructure and you can hire a bunch of people or you can dragoon a bunch of volunteers. Uh, I can't do that. However, these methods are great complements to that. You can take that information that you get from hand coding, and the reason hand coding is good is because you can control it. The reason it's bad is because you can't do it a billion times. You can do this all day long. You can do this to the entire Wikipedia if they gave me the data set. All right, so longer exposure can help discover reader-editor divergence. So you can start to see, I said I can predict in static sense whether or not something's a featured article or not. I promised when I wrote this abstract that I'd be able to predict in a dynamic sense. I can't because I don't have enough data. Or I can, but it's not much better than chance and the confidence intervals are huge. Um, what do you mean by dynamic and static sense? Okay, so remember, all the way back here. Burr, burr, burr. All right, so um, this is the information that I have at a given time on individual ratings. I also have the average of ratings over the course of this across each of the articles. And there, there, it's two sides of the same coin. So what I am saying is if I have a particular set of characteristics about an article that I'm just looking at you know, from one point in time, then um, I can get a guess as to whether or not that is or isn't a featured article. When I say dynamic, I mean if I watch editor ratings start to decline, maybe does that go to FAR, or it's a featured article review where it will demote something. I don't have enough information for that, but if I did, I probably could. All right. All right. Um, you can also do predictive analytics, which is, you can have a repeat of this. And you need more open data. One other thing that I want to mention, I have one minute, 53 seconds left. We have been talking this whole conference about the divergence between what the Wikimedia community is doing with their role and their, and their information and the articles that they're building and what the rest of the world looks like. You heard a lot about the role of women. You heard a lot about the Global South. You heard a lot about other languages. Reader feedback is a window into this. You know, in this case, it's only a window into how people think on the English Wikipedia, but as it expands, it is a window into this. And if you get more research on this, you can discover where these divergences exist. Right, the, the classifier that I, that, I, that I built was really simple, right? Three or four variables. If you, had, if you looked at like categories that an article was in, if you looked at features of the title, if you looked at revision history, then you could get much more information on wh how readers feel about something versus how editors feel about something. And that's part of solving the problem of matching the culture of Wikipedia to the rest of the world, right? So how do we do this? I need more open data. Please give me data, feed me data, all right? Um, or not open and private, I don't care, more data. Um, and that's, that's basically it. Uh, give me data and trust me, no. Um, <laughs> you don't need to trust me, okay? Um, everything that I've done on here is either on GitHub right now or will be shortly. And it's all under a free license. You can take it, you can reproduce it, you can steal it, you can use it for nefarious purposes, you can build a really terrible rocket to Mars um, because I'm bad at this, but uh, you do whatever you want with it. And I have a r initial write-up when uh, it was just a classical model on the English Wikipedia that you can read right now. A full write-up will be forthcoming later. Thank you. You have the same... Um, um, so, um, I know for myself, when I, uh, when I write an article... Oh, Okay. When, when, when I write an article, um, I, very freak, I very seldom will write it all ones or all fives. So is there um, uh, any information on whether um, registered users write articles very differently from anons? Um, so one of the things that I said early on as I was rushing through this was that we really, frankly, we had zero registered users, right? So you have two and a half million um, feedback points and a very small number of them are registered users. There is a difference, right? Uh, I don't want to overstate it off the top of my head because it's one of the, I feel that it's one of these things where we tend to um, think of ourselves as more nuanced than everyone else. Um, I can personally attest that, oh, I'll get Mitt Romney off here. Um, I can personally attest that, um, that 
I have rated articles all ones and all fives. Um, what I am suggesting is regardless of how it breaks down between registered and non-registered, that particular <coughs> behavior is not common. Or it's, you know, it's, it's not like, it's not unheard of, but it's not, you're, you, you're not in the majority. Um, first of all, it's very interesting data. I would would say that you should, would have to take great caution about generalizing this. If we see that that most of the articles are only uh, rated by one or two persons, because this is not very representative at all. So I'm social scientist and I'm all about samples and be really careful what you derive from this because. First of all, I think just a really non-representative sample of editors readers goes, goes all the way down to the bottom of a page to rate something. This is not a general sample that can be uh, representative. And second of all, and we think about that maybe if one per person just found this star little nice stars where you can rate and he goes through all the articles and does it everywhere, that's maybe s the same person or the same set of just 10 persons that rates a long list of articles. So be, you have to be careful including this data. So the question would also be, did you try to exclude these articles that had less than 50 or 20 ratings and see if it changes afterwards? So um, <coughs> there is a bunch of material that's already been worked on that I left out of this talk because I felt that it fell into that category of dealing with the robustness of what we're talking about. Um, the first thing is matching editors to articles, dealing with the supposition that, that you know, one, some editors are going across multiple months articles. There were so many articles rated and so many different users that that, that becomes a, a uh, uh, that becomes relatively unnecessary, whatever effect it has on the overall thing. Now, your concern about small um, rating samples for individual articles, I am 100% in agreement with. And I have, there's a couple of ways that I try to convince myself that some of this was legitimate, like you know, taking, comparing um, you know, the ratings where they got more than 10, where they had less than 10, so on and so forth. Um, <coughs> I don't have an answer to that yet. I'm not going to make a broad, generalizable claim because I am worried that some of these are very few. However, if you get into 100% deployment for a long period of time, then that goes away, or at least the, you know, you still have the power law. That will never go away. You still have the, the vast majority of your articles will receive fewer than, fewer than, you know, 10 ratings. But you have enough in the rest of the tail to be able to work with convincingly. The, the problem with editors or readers self-selecting because they go to the bottom of the page, that's well taken. I, but you, you know, you go to war with the data you have. Right? You, you, there's just, there isn't, uh, with, you know, with, without doing, um, uh, you know, expert review or without doing um, uh, uh, hard hand coding, it's very difficult to get that out of encyclopedia of viewers. But those are all great concerns and absolutely a share. Yeah, uh, my question is you're identifying some of the best articles. Do you have some examples of what are the most, yeah, thank you. You know, you're identifying some of the best articles. Have you identified some of the most troubled articles? And I have a, a very quick anecdote about what I consider to be a deeply troubled article. And that's, if you go to uh, Amazon.com right now, you can find not one, but two Kindle editions that are plagiarized from top to bottom from you know, a past edition of what I, what I believe is a very flawed article. That was the murder of Meredith Thurcher article. So what articles have you identified as, as very troubled? So the problem with making that identification is that I don't have the ability to scale that up. Right. And the reason why I chose feature articles and good articles wasn't necessarily because I was interested in the absolute best content. It's because I was interested in the difference between what happens when something is deep featured, right? And what happens when you know you, you reach that transition. There's something of a discontinuity that you can start to exploit. And so that's absolutely I need to be able to identify, I need to work down into like A class, B class, C class um, articles. But I'm very, I, I would probably tell you right out of the bat that I, it would be so difficult to say these are problem articles. Uh, I'm going to get control for that. Because even, like, you know, even, even like cleanup templates, they're on 700,000 articles and you know, that sort of thing. But that's a, that's a very good concern. So we have one more question. Yeah. I'm wondering who does the rating, and I guess from IP address you can often get geography. Does geography of the raters look like editors? So, so these, are, these are anonymized. 
right? You, I have I have no information about all I know is they are a registered editor, and all I know is if it's one person ed editing or one person reading multiple <coughs> or grading multiple articles. That's all I know. It's just a, it's a hash. So all right, thank you. Thank you very much. So we move on to the next session. Okay, I'm Jane Richardson. Uh, going to talk to you about trying to get content expert editors involved, which is a sort of a struggle, but I think really worthwhile. And uh, okay, so I've just been a Wikipedia editor for about three years. I started in January '09. Uh, before that, of course, like all my friends and everybody else in the world, I used it all the time. And it was a great change to find out how easy it was to edit and how much fun it was. Uh, and I'm trying to get other people turned on to this. I also sort of have uh, math and stat envy. The mathematics and statistics articles are really, really good. I find them more useful than a textbook generally. And I just wish that the information in, in the biophysics area were that good. So uh, as you can see, I also like doing mountain and flower pictures. Uh, but, and I've mainly been active on uh, commons because one of the things that's a big lack is good enough illustrations. And everything that we do, my husband and I work on molecular graphics and everything we do is graphics and illustrations very geometrical. So we've got a lot of illustrations and getting them out there is a really great thing to do. So it's really satisfying when somebody else picks up something that you've done and uses it for something that you didn't think about at all. But then uh, really for most editors who are not an expert in that particular subject, it's perfectly doable to get the information and do a really good job of it. Uh, finding articles and textbooks and, and uh, other sources of information is fine, but getting open license images is not easy. And then it's also hard to really be up to date. And so uh, this, oops, sorry. Sorry. This is an up-to-date picture of what's called a Ramachandran plot. So this is the backbone conformation of proteins. And we now have a couple of million data points of good data. A while ago, we only had 100,000 points and they weren't all that great and the earlier systems were way less accurate. And you know, somebody just going in and, and doing an article from the outside wouldn't have access to the new data or wouldn't know about it even. So it seems to me that those are two of the big lacks for non-expert editors, but they're also problems for expert editors that are different. So this year I happen to be president of the Biophysical Society, which has nominally got 9,000 members. And you know that's an awful lot of potential editors if they would only do something. And uh, so at this year's spring meeting, I gave a, a workshop about Wikipedia, Wikimedia, and got a small audience sort of like this. And they got very enthusiastic and really excited about this. We had really expert help from Phoebe Ayers. That was a big draw to have somebody who really knew about Wikipedia things. and. We started a wiki project, Biophysics. And we even got a couple of people to sign up in the room during the session and they were saying it just changed their whole outlook and so on. And then nothing happened. <laughs> uh, you know, I did a bunch of stuff and actually a few people who were already Wikipedia <laughs> editors got interested and started doing things. But now it's gaining momentum and we're getting a lot more use. And so I'm beginning to feel optimistic about it again. So we have 13 people signed up on this, which isn't a whole lot. But uh, now, finally, all but three of them have actually done a bunch of things. And three of us have done a lot. 
And then the other people have done something substantial, e except for three who haven't gotten into it yet. So I think this really can have momentum, and also the people are interacting with each other. So the different editors who are working on these things are giving advice to each other and encouraging each other, I think. So what's hard, at least in science, for the subject content experts is to explain it in clear language rather than writing it the way they would write a journal article or a, uh, let alone a textbook. Uh, and then to know that they can't just say something that they know is true. That's one of the hardest ones. I think when people come in initially as editors and they're experts, uh, they just don't understand that at all. And so they will just put things in, maybe with some journal references, but not at the level that, that Wikipedia would want. And then, again, a very hard one is no original research. Uh, that's really difficult when that's your whole job and that's what you do all the time. I find it very difficult. Sometimes I cheat a little bit. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm learning at least uh, trickier ways to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> well, it helps to be able to put things up on commons. So uh, really, as this has taken off, we've made what I think is a lot of good progress. And uh, two nights ago, we got a new featured article promoted. And last night, we got a good ar article promoted. And uh, I think they're both really excellent. We started a new article, uh, which is still fairly primitive, but I think it'll develop into something good. Uh, we've got another GA candidate. We've taken a bunch of articles up to what I think would be uh, B class. And uh, I don't really know, you know, how to rate things. And that's one of our problems is learning this sort of thing. And we have both new editors who came from the society, and then we've also involved people who were already Wikipedia editors. And now that we have the project, uh, there are a whole lot of bots that are helping and figuring out what's in our domain and <laughs> listing things and rating them. So this is the good article, which is a biography. And I think this really is important. There are remarkably few decent biographies of recent scientists. There are some good, very good ones of older uh, historical scientists. And this is our featured article on DNA nanotechnology, which is really pretty cool stuff. And uh, so we've had a good deal of variety. So we have the biography. We have this recent technical article. We have things on the alpha helix, for instance, which was and beta sheet, which I thought were pretty bad when I got started, but I've been working on them. And we've had students in classes work on articles like that. So my conclusions are that the two hardest things uh, on a project like this are that all of these people are under huge time pressure. I mean, I am too. The only thing that happens is, is once you get into this, you get totally hooked and obsessed with it, as you all know. And so that's what you put your spare time into instead of reading science fiction or something. And so. Uh, that's a big deal, and I'm sure that's why these three people haven't actually done anything. Uh, there's also this difference of culture, and I think one of the things that I hope people can be gentle about is if somebody comes in and does really dumb things from the wiki point of view, like just sort of saying uh, what they think is true without any documentation, please don't just delete it. Explain to them what's wrong. Because I have a couple of good friends who would be really great at this, both of whom got turned off in different ways. One of them got vandalized and didn't know he could get help and have it taken off right away, so it took two months for somebody else to find it and delete it. And the other one, I think, did a bunch of things wrong in the beginning, and uh, <coughs> then his stuff was all deleted. And then he got very defensive about it, and so they were all arguing about it, and it was sort of hopeless, and he's gone away. Uh, but what I'm hoping to do, at least with this, this one particular set of people, is to try and get them in by saying, 
You don't have to get into this in a big way. Just learn enough to make simple edits so that when you're going in and looking at something on Wikipedia and you find something you think is wrong or that you could add to or that's annoying, <coughs> you go in and fix it. And try to show them also enough not to get in trouble doing that. But if you're just making a few edits, you're not apt to get in big time trouble. It's usually when, when you're doing a big revision like these other two people were. And then, once they get into doing this, I bet a lot of them really will get hooked, then uh, to tell them, as I say, about verifiability and no original research and so on, uh, and then how to get help if something happens and how to interpret what people say back to them about what they're doing. And then, as far as the time pressure, partly it's getting people obsessed and then also I think we can involve students who really enjoy this. They, they find it very motivating to, to go in and actually edit Wikipedia. And retirees, then there's one other point that really uh, goes to the last talk in a way that, as I say, we needed to learn how to, how to evaluate things. I still don't think I really understand it. And so in order to try and do that, I nominated some things and I made a lot of comments and, and watched the comments on other reviews. And there was a lot of really excellent interchange. I mean, people made very constructive, useful suggestions. And I appreciate that a lot and I've learned a lot. But I was really very disappointed that most of the real official reviews were about details of format, real details. I mean, they really care whether you have a dash or an, an N dash or a hyphen on your pages. And that's the thing that comes up, you know, top of these reviews. Well, okay, we should get it right. But that's not what, in my mind, makes a featured article, frankly. And then about details of style. And the trouble is that there are a lot of rules about style. And in a lot of cases, they conflict with each other. So that in order to do one thing, you have to compromise another one. And the different people who making comments didn't always agree about them. But again, we should do this well, we should be consistent, but it seems to me that what really matters is the content and the coverage and particularly making it understandable. Making the language good and the illustrations good and uh, there was very little of that except from you know, the local people or the odds and ends of people. So I think that's one reason that your readers and your editors aren't all that much in agreement. I don't think they're actually uh, thinking about the same things. And I would love to see us think about featured articles as ones that are exciting and understandable, as well as, you know, clean and, and every single half sentence has a, a reference and so on. So at next year's uh, meeting of the society, I'm going to try doing a working session with a little bit of introduction, but, you know, try to get a set of people to sit down together and actually edit some things and see whether that works better. But I am very encouraged uh, that after four or five months, we're really getting some traction, which we didn't at the beginning. So we'll see. And uh, that's all, and hope you have some questions. Hi there. I'm one of the people who was complaining about your use of um, hyphens over dashes in the <laughs> article. <laughs> um, we had a very long discussion on featured article project about having subject matter experts as reviewers as a way of addressing the issue you raise about um, the non-content review. Do you have any comments about that? Well, I think it would be a useful thing to do. The part of it and I can see why that one's a problem. And certainly for our project, we can do that part of it. In general, that's not so easy. Uh, what I would really love to see is to have non-experts do the understandability review. Uh, because that's, that's very hard for you to do when you know things.
There's a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of articles which are correct, but they are simply completely incomplete. You know, there's a lot of stuff missing, which I know about. Or there are things, you know, which are complete, but not understandable, you know. And so it, it doesn't make sense to rate them by mm -hmm. you know, one five scale, for example. Well, the new system's going to do a lot of that. I think it'll be pretty neat, because it really is based more on comments now than, than ratings. So it was interesting how you said that you were trying to get the professors to edit Wikipedia sort of in their spare time. I'm wondering if you've made any efforts to figure out how you could integrate um, their contributions to Wikipedia into the TMP process in any way. I mean, can these count as, can there What's the CMP project? Uh, the tenure and promotion process. Um, can it count as service for them in biophysics? Can it count as a publication, as if they would write an entry in another kind of encyclopedia? Because then they're more motivated to do it. Mm -hmm. That would be great. I think we're a long way from that. It's hard enough to get people to count uh, teaching, really, or to really count, uh, you know, review articles or lay things, or even uh, doing structures as opposed to writing papers. So maybe, maybe someday. So actually, I have a great comment on this. Does anybody hear me? Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if who of you guys have seen. There was one talk, or actually several talks, about a new tool which people have developed to uh, convert open access published papers into a Wikipedia article. And I think that's a perfect you know, um, compromise between the academic need for publications and actually putting all that stuff online. I think that's awesome. That stuff really works. Then academics can really publish and at the same time contribute really a lot of stuff to Wikipedia. Well, you have to watch out, though, because those open access articles are still the pedantic scientific articles. You know, I, I, but having them out is great. I mean, I'm, I'm a big advocate of open everything, all of our software, all of our papers, uh, everything's sure out there. General Wikipedia policy is no primary sources, secondary sources, so you need review articles, not original articles. Um, but I think your position within this organization gives you the possibility of incentivizing. If you can't get to you know, tenure level decisions, you could have a session here where you're recognizing somebody in your community is making significant contributions to general knowledge, and Wikipedia is part of it. So you're obviously doing quite a bit that way, but I would wonder in the same way that we do barn stars or some other recognition on the pages, recognition within your society could be a very compelling way to bring scientists into this fold and then show them in front of all of their peers, you're not the only one doing this. There is this community. I think the barn star level is a great idea. I had thought about some more formal, <coughs> thorough ones, like I actually nominated somebody who did Wikipedia stuff for an education award. They didn't get it this time, but it might another time. And I think announcing that in public would be really great. And we have an education committee who are quite enthusiastic about uh, the Wiki project. And that, at least within that little community, does something. So uh, yeah, I think it's a very good thing to think about. Maybe me more of an accusatory question. Um, so one, one of the problems that you ran into with the higher levels of peer review was that it was more copy editing sorts of responses. Have you thought about you yourself going and reviewing other good article candidates and featured article candidates that are not either in your sort of field of interest or you know bordering that? Be I'm just speaking well, from the point of view. Well, that's what I'm trying to lead up to. Yeah, and just you know, speaking as like a good article reviewer, we absolutely, absolutely, absolutely need someone who knows just a little bit or cares just a little bit about content to come in because that's the that's the really distinguishing factor. It's it's not that they don't care; it's it's that they don't know. Like it's very difficult for me to like make an authoritative criticism of DNA mm -hmm. nanotechnology because I'm an economist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I did go in and do some reviewing on that article, and uh, I, so I've been trying to do it in both directions, on both the good ones and the featured ones, uh, and that's one way of learning things. I haven't felt that I knew enough to be a, the primary reviewer, but I've made comments and you know watched back and forth on, on what was there. 
And that was very educational and I hope useful. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, great. So I'm going to give a basic talk about Wikipedia books and how the offline content, uh, the online content drives the offline content. And uh, well, let's see how it goes. So I'm uh, Gaetan Landry, also known as Headbomb on the English Wikipedia. And I have about 110,000 edits on the English Wikipedia. Uh, I've personally created about 250 books. Uh, does it matter? Well, officially, no. Uh, but in real life, it's sort of like I have an informed opinion about this stuff. So, <laughs> uh, I have a disclaimer to say. I also am affiliated with Pedia Press, which print these books offline. So there's like a teeny wee bit of conflict of interest here, but I'm sure it's not all that important. So, uh, for for purpose of this presentation, I'm also a member of uh, Wiki Project Wikipedia Books. Wiki Project Physics and Wiki Project Elements. I'm also part of like seven or ten other Wiki projects, and I won't list them all because they're kind of boring for this presentation. So, what exactly is a Wikipedia book? Well, it's a structured collection of articles. Like, it's a book, and in the book you have a structure, and that's what you try to do on Wikipedia. And you can have them in print form, which is printed by Pedia Press, or in digital form, which can be in PDF or uh, uh, docx or or open office documents or zim which is a reader format i think and uh i'm going to use the example of book hydrogen because i think everyone knows a bit about hydrogen and chemistry it's uh it's a fun topic and in general uh, you could go to category wikipedia books and find about uh many many other books we have about 9000 right now i think so for those interested in technical details, uh, the stuff is coded by Peter Press, and the code is available at github.com slash Press. And it's the media wiki, it's the extension collections. I'm not myself an expert on that, but Heiko Hees from Peter Press could probably talk to you about that a bit more if you're interested. So this is somewhat like what a book looks like on Peter Press, uh, on uh, Wikipedia. It's basically you take the collection of articles and you try to find a structure in that. So for hydrogen book, I basically did, well, there's the overview of hydrogen. So you have the main article, hydrogen, and some related topics like the anti-hydrogen thing and the hydrogen atom and related topics like isotopes and hydrogen-like reactions. And one of the things we have on, on Wikipedia is that on the talk pages, there's a bot called Noombot. And what Numbot does is basically checks every article and lists the article rating that uh, Adam talked to us about earlier. So for example, hydrogen is rated a feature article. Uh, Anti-hydrogen is a C-class article, so it's of lower rating. So for you as a content creator, these book reports sort of allow you to see where the work is needed. Like the last one at the very bottom is solid hydrogen. It's currently a stub, so if you want to improve the hydrogen book, that would probably be the place to start working first. And we can see some other stuff too, like here you have a cleanup column. And in the cleanup column, you see the anti-hydrogen article needs a citation. So these reports basically allow you to get a good glance at the current quality of the articles, but also uh, what kind of cleanup is needed in the article. And in this book, in this case, there is no non-free media. So it means that every of these articles will be printed as is. And as an editor, you might also be interested in the tools column, which is basically uh, very quick links to common tools that help you improve the article. For example, the citation bot or the external links examiner, so you can see if there are some dead links in the article or not. So all these things makes it very easy for you to basically improve a topic all at once. So now is the part of the presentation that I did not have time to do since this morning. <laughs> so, so I'm just going to wing it. And uh, let's start with uh, going on Wikipedia. 
and uh, now I think it's called Safari, which is and well, Firefox. There, I like Firefox. <laughs> so let's start with. Uh, well, we'll see where it goes. Now it's a little more reasonable than that's free. All right. So let's go to Wikipedia. And let's take a book about pancakes. Because we all like pancakes. So this is what a book looks like when it's uh, on Wikipedia itself. So you have a book about crepes, pancakes, and waffles. So you can see at the top of the thing is basically a banner uh, giving you a couple of links where you can download the PDF uh, or the open document format, or you can open it in the book creator, which is the tool developed by Wikipedia. So if we just take a quick review at this book, uh, you can see there's quite a lot of pancakes in the world. So for the gastronomers out here, this would be a pretty interesting book to have. And so about the book report, if you see on this talk page, eventually it'll load, it's right here. And this here is basically the overview of the book. So in this book, we have no featured article, we have no featured list. And basically the best has a C-class rating. So this book could use a lot of work. And especially if we click show here, this will expand all of this, we can see that the first article on Abelskiver has a dead link. So that's somewhere you could do some improvement. And you can just go down the list and see there's a lot of cleanup issues in this book to make. So that's one place where, where these kind of book really expand on, on the, um, the uh, possible uh, place to improve content on Wikipedia. And uh, I'll show you some of these tools. For example, if you click on this ambig, this is a, gl a global cleanup tool. If you click here and wait for a while, Basically, what we'll do is check every article for any links that links to a disambiguation page that uh, should really not be there. Is is basically if you go in this article and you click on that link, you will be taken to the disambiguation page when you should be taken to an article about something that's relevant to pancakes. And it's taking a lot of time to load, so I guess I'll just stop that right here. Instead, I'm just going to show you on the main banner. Uh, there's, in the bottom, there's a couple of convenient links about books, uh, the FAQ, some feedback you could give about books. But on the bottom right corner of the banner is the recent change thing. So this can act as a, van, uh, as basically as a big watch list for the topic without you having to subscribe to any of these articles personally. So you can easily find uh, vandalism issues, you can see which articles were recently improved, for example, the article about Ego is pretty active recently. So maybe it's vandalism, maybe it's content edits. Uh, it's basically fun stuff. But since Cluebot got involved, uh, chances are it was like bad edits. But you can see all of that from the book. And that's, that's very, very useful. And uh, another thing books can do is often you have like Wikiproject Physics, Wikiproject Biophysics, for example, or Wikiproject Chemistry. These are pretty much all large-scale collaborations, uh, and you can have well, a few people, like maybe five people per project, or some like military history has like a few hundreds. Uh, but what it does, it these books sort of allow you to create mini wiki projects. Like perhaps you're interested in tires, like car tires. You obviously won't have a wiki project car tires. But you could make a book about these tires and like brands of tires, tire design, uh, what kind of rubber you could use. And this would create a topic. And you could use the book's talk page like as the go-to place for anyone interested in tires. And you can have, you can distort the topic in general. You can see, all right, well, these articles are missing from our topic. We should create them. And the book would be a natural place to discuss that. You could also have, well, we have these articles and they should probably be merged. That's another place where you could discuss this. And so basically you have 
and being a wiki project without the bureaucracy of setting up a wiki project for yourself because you have a watch list you have a discussion page and you have like reports of what's going on with these article with the assessments and the ratings and the cleanup issues and all of that stuff and so that's really really useful for anyone that wants to create uh to really improve a topic but not necessarily like a big fancy topic that will require like a collaboration between like 50 people you can do it with like with three people and that's what's great about them and uh there was one other thing i wanted to mention but i sort of forgot oh yes let's render a book let's see how they look so this is a big book so let's go elsewhere what's the slash slash Yeah, probably. Eventually, I'll get it right. Why doesn't it get it right? Yeah. It's very sensitive to that stuff. All right, there is a page named that. Why don't you take me there? All right, so this is a book about the editor war, which for those of you who is familiar is a like bit of a old debate on VI versus Emacs and who is right and who is wrong. So I thought it was a funny thing to do. And for, it, it, for, for a while, this book existed on Wikipedia, but I checked this morning and some guy deleted it in the end of May, like out of process. And so now it's a deletion review, so it should be back up uh, recently, uh, soon on the Wikipedia. But uh, let's take a look at what it looks like in PDF. So this is the live rendering time. It'll take about a minute to render, and it'll look pretty nice at the end. So now it's fetching articles, laying out the stuff. Now we wait, we wait, we wait, we wait. And, and, there was this XKCD comic about the guy who coded the Windows file system progress bar. And he was saying, I'll be there in like 15 seconds. No, looks like more like three days. Nope, 20 minutes. <laughs> and this feels a bit like it. All right, so now it's going on again. The licenses, yes, because we credit all the people that work in the book per license restrictions. And now it's done, so we only have to download it. So download the file. It's about 1.5 meg, and there it is, the editor war. So we can go down, and there is a table of content, fully indexed. And here is the overview. That's, oh, I made a typo, but oh well. So the editor war is the common name for the rivalry between users of the VI and Emacs text editors. And uh, so basically, that's what a book looks like when you print it in PDF. This is what you would get if you do it yourself. Uh, it's about, I think it was 23 pages long. Uh, I mean, like, the pages are, they match, whatever. And uh, when you go to the end, there's an index of, like, links. So you can see which term is, is uh, like, you, it's not as if a human would design the index of, of, of things, but it's pretty close, so it's pretty good. Uh, I think it does not at the time, but that definitely could be incorporated over time. Um, but, yeah, that's something to... To work on, I guess. So that's what it looks like. And if you order it from PDF Press, uh, why not show you how that looks? All right, then I lost Safari. So where would that be? Chrome or Chrome? Yeah, I'm an old Windows guy. So so this is the the Windows Mac problem that you. The, that's the minimize button, yeah. and because Apple is uh, fey, they like to hide it um, before you put your mouse over it. All right, so let's go back on Wikipedia.
and you can see there's an upper printed book. So if you click that, that will take you to the PDFers website and the book will be laid out. The PDF you saw was in A4 format and the book is slightly smaller than A5, so basically it's A4 folded one over the other. And it's a very neat thing. It, it, it doubles about the number of pages, so we had 50 pages. This in print form would be about 100 pages. So you would have a 100 page book about the editor war. Who would have thought? <laughs> and, and there's basically a plethora of things you could do with that. Uh, I did the book on toilet paper and I have it in my toilet because I think that's the perfect toilet book to read. <laughs> Yes, toilet paper roll, and there's a, we have a good article on the orientation of, of paper. <laughs> because there is a, a huge debate as, do you want to put it over or under? There are two types of people, and... Like the exactly! <laughs> and so the, the thing is, you can make a book about pretty much anything you want, and uh, it, it's really a fun feature. So I guess that's what I had to do, so sorry for the technical problems, hope you enjoyed it. Oh, and, and since I'm sort of affiliated with Peter's, only 10 bucks, not even. Um, a couple of quick questions. You said it's um, an A4, so we can lay it out in letters. Uh, that's a technical thing. Right now, I don't think that's implemented, but if you print it out on, on letter paper, it will be centered, so it will still look nice. Um, can you walk through making a book? I, I tried it a couple of years, like a year or so ago, I think it the extension was busted or was uh, possibly notably, you know, occasionally or frequently not working. Okay, well, how you would go about creating a book. Okay, um, basically on the side here, there's a tool, where is it? Print export right here. So you just click create a you book. Like grab a tire article, like, you said, like a tire article that has your tires? Yeah, you can grab the article per article. You can use categories. Uh, you can build it. It's very possible. Honestly, I have not looked at this until this morning for the last three months. Was it working, not working well in the past year or so? Yeah. I was trying to I'd make books and they disappear. Are we oh, that's the caching issue. I don't know if that has been resolved. What I personally do is I save the book to my user space and then I know it's there, so it can't go away. So it's basically you, you do a hard save. Maybe not the ideal solution, though. Any other question from this guy over there? You may have said this already, but when, when you write a book, writing a book. Yeah, it's uh, writing in, in quote. It's just yes. you select the article. So articles. when you yes, when you when you go about creating a book, uh, you're basically choosing a topic, uh, choosing either through through some uh, automatic process or manually choosing which articles will be included. And there's an overview. Do you write the overview, or is it also pulled out of Wikipedia? The, for me, what I call the overview is the main article. For example, in hydrogen, the, hi the overview would be the hydrogen article. And that's basically what I call the overview. But uh, you, yeah, that's it. So, so you, you don't, there's no, is there space for, for instance, <laughs> Writing a preface, or uh, you could do that in your user space, then include that page in the book. Uh, but I don't think like a preface would be part of like the encyclopedia proper. But you could do it, yes. Hi, Tom. Could you just create a book on tires, like in a minute? Uh, I could try, I guess. So let's go with ducks. No. All right, so basically with the book creator, you just click add this page to your book, and then it's added. So that's the first step. Uh, it's part of the Anatidae family of birds, so I guess that's a relevant article, so just click add link. And uh, what else could we add? Loons, add link. Yeah, and, and you would go and you can click about uh, tons of articles that way. 
there's also a manual way to do it if you just look at there on if you go at help books there's an FAQ that details how to do it manually if you prefer to do it that way but uh, let's say we're happy with these three articles the what yeah So let's just go show books. So basically, uh, you have a book. You can rearrange the articles in any way you like. So you just click and just put it there. And, and you can create a chapter or not. So let's go with, I don't know if the biologist will like me for that. So I just click create chapter, let's say species of ducks. So species, I would put it right here. And perhaps an overview chapter. which I would put at the top, obviously. And I call this ducks. And I'm going to save it at your namespace. <laughs> you could do it on, there's a book namespace, which is basically uh, the, it's Wikipedia's equivalent of articles, but we have books like official with Wikipedia books that belong to everyone that can be edited by like articles are you can collaborate with, you can calibrate with people on, on books not, not your own user well in your user space it's basically a convention that you're free to do whatever you want so someone can't argue with you well I don't like your book so I'm gonna take out these articles and I don't like this and this and this and I don't like the order you put so if you're in your user space you can do what you want and if you're in the book namespace, you pretty much have to work with people as you would on an article. But you can't, but the point is you can collaborate. You can jointly author and collect. Yes, yes, for sure, yes. What will determine whether a book stays in the public space? Well, is it, there's no real policy on that, really. It's basically common sense. So if you make a book on, I don't know, uh, tires, like I used before, uh, is the book well written? Is it well structured? Is it neutral in its point of view? Is it like tires how Michelin is not a good company? That would not stay in the... But if you just work a bit on tires, if it makes sense as a topic, if there's a structure to it, then there's really no argument against having that book. It, it, it should stay. And there's very, very few books that got deleted, mainly because people use this feature reasonably. Even if it's an obscure topic, yes. I could write a book on the grunge bands of Burlington, yes, yes, and people have. There's, there's a book on the punk scene in California. There's a book on Iron Maiden, which is not really obscure, but there is also books on Regina Spector, which is quite more obscure. So yes, any, any topic you can think of is valid. Well, I guess that's that, so... I hope you enjoyed it.